This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Welcome to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you again for listening. Our topic today is an introduction to the thought of Rene Girard, and my guest is Dr. Gregory Thornberry. Greg is the Vice President for Development at the New York Academy of Art in New York City. He's a philosopher and the former president of King's College, also in New York. So my conversation with Dr. Thornberry today is about the work of the French philosopher and anthropologist René Girard. In this conversation, we lay out some of the foundations of Girard's thought, and Greg helps explain and walks us through some of his key ideas, especially the idea of mimetic desire. Girard argues that mimesis, or imitation, is at the source and foundation of our desire, and that this imitative desire creates rivalry and conflict. And when this happens, the community of people tries to eradicate the rivalry and eradicate the conflict by scapegoating a victim. This, Girard calls the mimetic cycle, which he maintains is at the foundation of ancient religion and is a constitutive part of human nature. Now, all of this sounds very complex, and it is, But Girard is really worth reading. He's a profound thinker that helps elucidate reality. And Greg does a great job of introducing some of his key ideas and his thought. So I hope you'll find this podcast helpful. Um, And I hope you'll find, uh, if you have not already read Girard, that you'll pick up some of his books. So in this conversation, we also talk about uh, how the Hebrew Bible and the books of the New Testament, especially the Gospels, shed light on the problem of mimetic desire and the problem of scapegoating. Now, as you'll see at the end, there's some things we did not cover, uh, but I hope to have Dr. Thornberry back on the podcast very soon and continue with a second part of an introduction to Rene Girard. So here is the first part of my interview with Dr. Gregory Thornberry on Rene Girard. I hope you enjoy. Thanks again for listening. And if you like the podcast and you think it's worthwhile, uh, please give it a good rating and share it with your friends. Dr. Thornberry, welcome. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me on, Michael. So let's talk about Girard a little bit. And why don't we start, maybe just give me a brief overview of who Girard is, what his intellectual project is, and maybe why he's important. And we can go back to why he's important uh, again, after we've talked about some of his ideas, but maybe just a kind of an, an overview there of who Girard is and what he's trying to get at. So, uh, René Girard is a significant thinker in the continental philosophical tradition uh, that uh, arose in the wake of World War II and re-examining the foundations of uh, Western epistemology. And he stands alongside other thinkers such as Gadamer and Wittgenstein and Levinas and Ricoeur and Derrida in the sense that he is uh, trying to provide uh, new foundations for uh, theoretical thought. In this case, his, uh, his discipline is anthropology, which is not the same thing as sociology. So for those of you that have read the screw tape letters, don't, don't damn Girard out of the box uh, labeling him as a, as a sociologist. He was an anthropologist. And to be technical, so anthro- anthropological philosophy. Right. Is, is his field, but he is a polymath. I mean, his work um, really started to uh, change and break through with a, a volume in the 60s called Desire, Deceit, and the Novel, where he uh, put forth his uh, theory of mimetic desire, which we will talk about. Mm-hmm. But uh, he combines fluidly the uh, disciplines of critical theory, literary criticism, psychology, philosophy, cultural history, um, 
and theology and uh, economics and, and sociology. And for this reason, uh, the Académie Française designated him as one of the French immortals, which means that it's, it's the highest honor that the French government gives. And it is, uh, it goes to people who, whose thought they believe will live on forever after they die. It will not be forgotten. Uh, so his, his work in, in, uh, Western Europe is highly regarded. And then, of course, he became a uh, professor at uh, Stanford University in California. And part of the reason why uh, Girard is significant, and by, by the way, uh, for those of you that are interested in uh, more biographical detail um, on Girard, there is a fairly new biography by Cynthia Haven called The Evolution of Desire, which uh, I would recommend. I'm one of those people. Uh, I'm with I'm with uh, Heidegger. You know, I don't care so much about the biography. Uh, it, it sometimes it, he lived, he thought he died. Um, <laughs> that sort of changed my mind uh, about that. So Girard, Girard's biography isn't really that interesting, but his thought is so outrageous in its claims. And the breadth of its uh, applications and scope that you either love him or you hate him. So if you can understand him, <laughs> how's that? <laughs> I like it. Well, and actually, I was talking to our friend Luke Burgess, who's also who's yeah. writing a book on Gerard right now. He actually recommended that biography too. He said it's actually um, helpful because he he thought that and the night he liked the title because he said it explains how Gerard's life, his biography reflected his thought, his reflected his kind of thinking through these things and, and, and what they meant and, and, and putting them into practice. So he recommended that as well. So let's, okay. So Gerard is this very kind of important thing. I, I remember I, I first came across Gerard, uh, I don't know how many years ago, over 10 or more. Um, uh, I was talking to Gil Bailey, who's a Gerard guy, yeah. and he told me to read Gerard. And so, he's the guy. by the way, Gil Bailey is the guy. Right. I want to talk to Gil Bailey too. So I t and he said, okay, well, and so I got things hidden since the foundations of the world. And to which I said, like, what? Bad place, to start. <laughs> Bad place to start for sure. So uh, definitely there are better places to start. So let's actually go and talk a little bit about, about Gerard and some of his main ideas. So you've already started with mimetic desire. So let's kind of like, maybe, maybe before we go into the details, give me, do you, could you give like a schematic uh, of Gerard, some of his key ideas? Like what, what are the things that like, maybe like the, the overarching theories uh, of Girard. Now he's got a lot of things and we're going to talk about some of them, but what's kind of the big picture? How would you describe that? So it begins with his theory of mimetic desire, which, uh, catch that. <laughs> sorry, Siri See, went off. There. See, this is why you shouldn't, you need to read Jaron Lanier on why you should uh, not turn off all that stuff. So, <laughs> okay. Um, We'll, we'll restart on that. Girard's theory is based in his um, setting forth of the pervasiveness, the in, endemic pervasiveness in all of human culture of mimetic desire. The fact that uh, human beings do not want things intrinsically um, – prima facie because they are inherently good or inherently desirable. We desire things because other people desire them. So mimesis simply means imitation. So uh, I, I'm known for wearing bow ties there is no intrinsic reason I would be interested in wearing bow ties. It's actually odd. You know, people talk about this, uh, you know, Apple computer, uh, Microsoft, there was this culture of we're not going to dress like the IBM corporate man. We're, 
where does where do ties come from? Why do people wear them? You know, there might be some sort of uh, provenance to it, like it was to prevent food from spilling on, you know, one's clothing. And then it got adopted into some maybe Louis the 14th in Versailles. They began wearing it as, as decorative. But the point is, is that we want things because other people want them. Now, what happens with mimetic desire is that it begins um, this sort of whipping up this cyclone of, of uh, when you have various different people all wanting the same thing, that inevitably leads to conflict because of this scarcity of resources. Um, and Girard actually does a, an amazing job of explaining why things like taboos uh, exist. It's because of this mimetic desire. So it's, uh, it is, since it is endemic to the human psychology, it creates conflict, and that conflict builds to the point where it inevitably results in violence. So that's the first, that's the first sort of uh, tentpole of Girard's thought. So do you want to follow up on that before yeah. I go on to the other ones or? Well, just briefly, I think it's interesting at the beginning of um, his book, I See Satan Fall Like Lightning. He actually starts uh, in the, the first chapter um, <clears throat> with uh, the Ten Commandments. And so yeah. he goes to the Ten Commandments and then makes this interesting argument uh, that I haven't heard except for Gerard, probably some, maybe some of the church fathers do it and I'm just unaware of it. But he goes through the commandments, right? And then the prohibitions, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, bear false witness. And then the, 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 the last commandments, depending how you count them, nine and 10, are about coveting, that you shouldn't covet the house of your neighbor, you should covet the wife of your neighbor. And, and Gerard actually makes the point that this in many ways is the summary or the starting point of all the prohibitions, right? That it's in fact comes from this imitative desire that you want what your neighbor has. Uh, right. That begins the cycle of uh, first contagion that everybody's wanting it, and then the and and, and internal violence. And so that the prohibitions are um, not simply prohibitions, uh, but they're actually connected to this mimetic desire that prevents, or the prohibitions prevent the outbursts of violence, right? That's exactly right. And so, okay, so now you've got this, and we'll go back through some of the conflict. And I think contagion, I think, is a very interesting idea. I mean, this is not just in Girard, but in other people on the, the contagion of crowds and how we, we desire what other people want. And, and for Girard, right, he, contagion plays an important role in, 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 in murder, which we're going to get to. Right, yes. uh, that that it people get whipped up into rivalry. So okay, so so we've got this imitative desire. We are coveting what other people want. We don't necessarily want things because they're good or because they're cool. They're like they're cool or attractive in themselves. We want them because Doctor Gregory Thornberry wears bow ties. He, <laughs> I'm going to imitate him and wear a bow tie as well. Right. right. It's an Absolutely. imitation. Okay. Well, Although I'm older than you. So I think I, I beat you at wearing bow ties, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, no, but there's a certain, right. Uh, and so then, but there's this desire because there's a sense of scarcity and, or at least an apparent scarcity in certain cases. And then, and then a rivalry breaks out and from this rivalry comes internal violence. So now you've got a problem on your hands. You've got violence. Now, where does Gerard go? So when you have this conflict, it builds to the point, think of it as a pressure cooker. At some point, the thing's going to explode. It's, it's going to blow. And culture frequently uh, um, reaches this point where it actually erupts into physical violence um, and and in, in murder. Uh, in, in this case, the next move that Girard makes, this is, his, this is his singular contribution, is to say that the archaic forms of religion 
uh, are based in violence, how to deal with the, the conflict and the violence that comes from mimetic desire. So all of the archaic forms of religion are based around the notion of ritualized sacrifice mm -hmm. as a way of taking the, uh, the sin of the people and putting it onto um, uh, a victim. So the, the victimage motif is the next big move and the victimage motif is rooted in ancient archaic forms of religion, which are all he claims, it's a sweeping claim, are all rooted in religious violence, how to deal with that problem. And so there are oblations and there are sacrifices made. There is blood spilt. And that's true of Canaanite religions. It's true of Babylonian ancient religions, Persian, and of course, the uh, Hebrew Bible as well. Okay, so I want to go back to that in a minute. But uh, he, there's a couple of questions I have there. But he, one of the things he talks about often is Oedipus, right? The Oedipal complex. Mm -hmm. So the, the yeah. idea, not the complex. I mean, he's kind of dealing with Freud a little bit. But the Oedipus, the, right? The the story, uh, um, how Oedipus uh, murders his father, marries his mother, all kind of through fate and accident, which we could. That's another topic. But and so he has brought evil to the, um, to the community and that evil needs to be pushed out. And so he has to, he has to become a victim, right? And he deals with this question of Oedipus. And this, this is kind of one of the core examples he gives. Maybe, could you explain that a little bit? Well, sure. He would say that the, the, the Oedipus story is, uh, is archetypal in this uh, ri ritualizing of, of, um, mimetic desire and how it plays out in society. So the uh, Oedipus Rex, the, you know, there's many different Oedipal right. stories, but the one uh, by uh, Sophocles. Right. Uh, so we know that Oedipus um, kills his father because um, he is, uh, he is, he is engaged in the ultimate societal taboo that seems to transcend all course uh, cultures, which is, uh, he's, he, uh, he is in love and sleeps with his mother. Um, what happens as a result of that act is that there is, there is a, uh, a plague that breaks out. Um, and this is where the, problem of hu human culture uh, creeps in. So whenever there is um, uh, some sort of, of major event, whether it's a, a plague or whether it's some other kind of societal unrest, there has to be an explanation for why this is happening. And in the case of Oedipus, um, it is uh, that he has violated this taboo. And so the, uh, he, his mother kills herself and he takes, his, takes her brooch off of her dead body and gouges out his uh, eyes. And then he becomes a pariah. And the plague has happened because Oedipus has you know, done this unthinkable thing, whether or not uh, he truly is guilty is immaterial to Girard. The guilt of actual guilt of the victim is beside the point. There has to be there has to be a victim upon which the community in a ritual fashion can exorcise their demons. So Oedipus is then cast out of, of the community. But here's the interesting thing about it. Mm -hmm. And he calls this the scapegoat me mechanism, right. right? Which I think everyone knows what a, a scapegoat is. 
Um, and it obviously plays a, a, a role in, in the, uh, the book of Leviticus, but the. Why don't you explain Why don't you explain the scapegoat really quickly? Sure. So, so the scapegoat mechanism is that, um, in order to, to deal with the pent up mimetic desire, someone has to be blamed and it, it never can be us. We'll get to that in a second. It's right. what Girard calls uh, the scandal. Okay, it's it's the stumbling block, and this is how the satanic uh, mechanism is play, plays a role. And we'll we'll come to that. But all of the uh, guilt of the people of the community is um, visited upon the victim. And once they are sacrificed, whether they're killed or, or not, Oedipus in, is not killed, but he's cast out of the community. But what happens is once the uh, conflict then goes away, the uh, mimetic cycle starts over again. But in that brief moment of parenthesis, it's almost like the book of Judges, where you have this cycle where, you know, the people uh, sin – they, you know, a foreign oppressor comes in, they cry out to God, God raises up a judge, judge destroys the uh, uh, oppressor, and the cycle starts over again. So in this parenthesis between the uh, scapegoating and the beginning of the next mimetic cycle, which is constant, the, uh, the scapegoat is then uh, worshipped. He's divinized, right? He's divinized yeah. because the problem went away because of the scapegoat. So in the Oedipus story, uh, Oedipus eventually dies and his, his um, sarcophagus is a sacred site of the gods. And then he's, he's lionized and divinized by people because uh, being the principal reason why the uh, uh, the conflict with how the conflict was resolved. All right, and this is so I don't want to jump ahead too too much. So if you just say talk about it later if you want to. So so you have so you have the we'll go through the mimetic desire, the contagion, the rivalry, the violence breaks out. Something goes wrong in the community. It has to be solved, and it's going to be solved by a scapegoat, some victim. Uh, whether they're guilty or innocent is immaterial, as you said, because what matters is that the people think they're guilty, right? That's yes. kind of important. The people <laughs> think they're guilty, right? <laughs> That's right. And there's this, so there's actually a double contagion. There's first, there's the contagion of mimetic desire. And then there's a secondary type of contagion. Maybe this is the bad explanation of it, uh, where all the people get together and decide that this particular victim is the problem. And so it's not as if even in, in the, in, in the decision that, you know, Oedipus is the victim, is the, is the, um, is the, has to be a sacrifice, the scapegoat. It doesn't, it doesn't really, it's not that every person immediately notices that the scapegoat is the cause, but contagion takes place among the people again, that makes them see this person or this, you know, this, this group of people as the scapegoat, right? So there's like a double contagion. Is that correct? That's correct. And in so in so doing, they take upon themselves the role of the gods because they are in the position. Then this is this is in I see Satan fall like lightning. They divinize themselves because they are meeting out uh, judgment. So this is. Uh, this is another archaic form of religion in, in that the priesthood is uh, erected to uh, deal with this problem of uh, mimetic desire and violence. And that's why religion is necessary to all archaic cultures and continues to be whether or not it is uh, an organized religion or not. Right. It still functions in that uh, role of uh, religious violence. Okay. So back to the divinization, um, like, like Luke Burgess, we talked about, he calls it cover up. I think 
Girard maybe uses similar language in that um, piece that you uh, sent me on the, what's called the evangelical subversion of myth, which I hope we'll talk about, is that part, so the next part of the divinization is also in a sense a cover up of, of the, of a, I don't know if it's a known, but a sense of evil that the community has done, right? So um, there's this very, I think, interesting and provocative part of uh, I See Satan Fall Like Lightning, uh, where he talks about the passage of can a Satan expel Satan? And um, when you read that, you think, okay, Satan can't expel Satan. But Gerard's saying, no, he's actually, that, 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 that the gospelers make another point that in fact, Satan does expel Satan. And, and that is there's disorder, right? From this contagion, rivalry, violence, but it's not expelled by true order. It's spell, expelled by another disorder, which is a new type of contagion of violence against and we'll get to this, an innocent victim, right? right? And that, and so I guess the two parts, so that's the one part maybe you could explain. And then the second is that maybe we're shifting gears too early, but this is one of the arguments that, that uh, Girard makes about both the Hebrew Bible and the books of the New Testament that- Specifically the gospels. Specifically the gospels, yeah. Uh, but, but also in the Joseph story, right? Yes. In, in, right, in Genesis, that yes. this is a- that the that Judaism and Christianity repudiate the murder and say no, the victim is actually innocent, right? So maybe we're oh, jumping okay. ahead. Okay, but- no, 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 no. But this is this is really important because to to get to early on in the conversation because without it, you can either view Girard's system as either profound or uh, trivially true. Right. You know, uh, and where it lapses into trivially true is uh, not understanding what he means by mythology and scandal and how the uh, Hebrew Christian stories undermine the the um, mythology of um, of these archaic religions. So let's take the Joseph story as the example par excellence of the scapegoating mechanism. And it is, uh, uh, Girard looks at the Joseph story, not only as uh, this great exemplar, but perhaps the greatest story ever told about the subverting of the myth of religious violence. So as we know in the Joseph story, there is a uh, mimetic desire is introduced in the fact right. that uh, uh, Joseph has his amazing technicolor dream coat. Right. <laughs> Are you going to sing? I look handsome, I look smart, I am a walking work of art, such a stunning coat of many colors. And then, of course, we know uh, through the Bible and through Andrew Lloyd Webber and and Tim Rice, um, uh, the brothers then start speaking, right? This is not the kind of thing we brothers like to hear. It seems to us that Joseph and his dreams must disappear. So Joseph is loved by the father. Right. He is the special affection of his father. So there you have the mimetic dimension. Mm-hmm. The father's love is not equally spread amongst the brothers. It is uh, special to Joseph. So Joseph must die. So they take him out into the wilderness. They throw him into this pit. And uh, the original idea is to to actually kill him until um, uh, one of the brothers, I, I believe Reuben, it is I think. Reuben. I think so. Uh, says, wait, uh, we should not we should not actually kill him. We should just seem to kill him and profit off of it. We'll sell him into slavery. But the the murderous intent is still the same. The desire is to kill Joseph. So he is. Escaped- oh, no, was it Reuben? This is just an aside, but one of the brothers, was it Reuben who said, maybe I'll come back and save him. Is there a meaning there that you're arguing with? Or should we yeah, just move yeah. on from that? It's come, well, we could talk about that, but that, that's a, that 
comes up later in that comes up later in 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 the story. Yeah. But, okay, let's but, keep, but let's there keep is going. This, there, there is this uh, suggestion that there is an awareness of this um, of the wickedness of the wickedness and this operation that is common to all of humanity. So Joseph is scapegoated, and then he is sent to Egypt to the house of this civil servant of Pharaoh Potiphar, and he is Joseph is scapegoated yet again. Right by Potiphar's wife because he is not willing to, um, to have, have an affair with her. With her. Yeah. Have an affair yes. With her. Yeah. She, she, she seeks after him out of respect for Potiphar, uh, and for his faith. He, uh, he re- rejects her advan- uh, advances and she, he is scapegoated yet again and is thrown into, into prison. In prison, Joseph um, also tries to fight against this uh, scapegoating mechanism by becoming friends with the guards. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible is Genesis thirty nine twenty two. It, it's it's maybe my favorite verse in the Bible. If anything got done in that place, it was because Joseph got it done. That's basically what it says. Uh, so Joseph rises to the top. Um, he is, there's a, another scapegoating mechanism where the, uh, the, the, um, the steward of, uh, he interprets the dreams of the, the steward and the baker of Pharaoh, uh, and he is forgotten once again until, um, as we know in the story, the, uh, he interprets the Pharaoh's dream he is exalted to the position of vizier or prime minister of Egypt. And then the famine happens. And Joseph having this uh, soothsayer type, um, you know, uh, uh, ability. And by the way, Joseph is a very controversial figure in Hebrew history because he does not set himself apart as a Jew in Egypt. He becomes Egyptian. His children's names are Egyptian. Unlike the Jewish people in other times of persecution, uh, Joseph becomes Egyptian. So when he uh, prophesies that this famine is going to happen, uh, his, the, they st- Egypt stores everything up. So all the nations have to come to Egypt. And that includes, of course, the brothers who are starving back in Canaan. Right. And so the beautiful thing for Gerard about the Joseph story is that initially, even Joseph himself, even though he has been scapegoated by his brothers, by Potiphar's wife, by people in the prison, even Joseph, and this gets to the issue of the scandal, how mythology operates us on us all, even though we don't notice, Joseph's initial instinct is to scape now scapegoat the brothers by pinning a false charge on an innocent victim, Benjamin, that he has, uh, he has uh, stolen his uh, brother's cup. So it, Joseph is, uh, is going to exact revenge. He is now going to participate in this system of mimetic desire. But he, he is broken when Judah says, let me stand in the place of my brother. He is, he is innocent. He is, he is not to blame. Uh, pin it on me, take me as sacrifice. And it is that interruption of that archaic mythological form that, that Joseph is, uh, broken hearted and reconciles with his brothers. And so here the, the, um, the archaic mythological cycle of violence is exposed. It, it, it's, it's brought out into the sunlight and you realize that this is the way it operates upon the world. So it's that subversion of what always happens that then continues in the gospels in which Jesus says, I have come to you. And Gerard deals with these texts that nobody, people mostly just skip over, mm-hmm. but Matthew 13, 35, I believe is, is the text. 
I've come to you to show you things that have been hidden from the foundation of the world. And it's this uh, mimetic cycle of, of violence and scapegoating mechanism. Okay, and so, so two things. One is, is, if I understand that Gerard is also saying that, that I want a couple things happen. So first there's, and we'll go to the, we'll go to the, the, the crucifixion in a moment, but first there's this bringing out of the sunlight, as you said, of the lie of the scapegoat that actually Joseph is innocent and Benjamin is innocent. And so it brings it open that this, this whole, this whole uh, cycle is actually um, disorder, not order. Uh, and, <clears throat> but also Joseph is not divinized. He could have been divinized because his brother, he's not divinized. So that the, so that the brothers obey the commandments, uh, as it were, uh, against idolatry. I mean, at this point, it'd be the Noahide commandments, but uh, they, they, there's, this, there's no idolatry. And, um, and so it's a, it's a mixture of, it, it's both the bringing out in the sunlight, the lie of a medic uh, cycle, but also stops the cover up through not divinization. That's correct. And, and notice that in the blessings of Jacob to his sons, all of the tribes of Israel are blessed. And here is the beginning of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel begins with the concept of subverting this cycle of ritualized mimetic desire. Right. Okay. And so that's very so, important. The Hebrew religion is based upon this uh, uh, beating the mimetic system. And this is the reason why it is a blessing to the world, to right. the whole world, mm -hmm. because it has that potential. So this is not just a Christian thing. This is a, 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 a Jewish thing. Right. Absolutely. And Jesus is a Jew. I mean, this is right. the reason why he's able to bring this to the Pharisees' attention in right. the Gospels. Well, and so this is actually, I want to go to that, that essay you had, if we have enough time, uh, which uh, deals with, with his, these, him bringing it, in fact, to the Pharisees' attention. But let's just say, uh, maybe explain uh, one relationship now to Joseph, but now also to Jesus on the cross, that Gerard argues, uh, if I understand, that Jesus also sheds light on the things hidden since the foundation of the world. The lie of the mimetic uh, cycle, that mythology, in fact, is a lie, which we hopefully will have time to talk about. Um, because it, he, it, it's revealed clearly that the victim is innocent. And that, in fact, Gerard argues that all the victims were innocent. That's correct. Can you explain that? It, yes. So... Uh, Time and again in his conversations uh, with, with the Pharisees, Jesus points out to them that um, there is this, he calls it a hidden collusion between murder and religious culture. Right. Yeah, I think it says like a collusion between human culture and violence or murder. That's, is the, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a great... Line. And it's ritualized. It's made religious. Mm -hmm. And that, that is what's satanic about it, is that people think that in carrying out these acts of religious violence, they're purging themselves when actually what they're doing is they are covering up the very problem, which is that uh, – and Jesus points this out to uh, the, the, the Pharisees, which is to say from the blood of Abel mm – -hmm. To the blood of Abimelech, you always do the same thing. You murder the prophets. Now, what is the response of the Pharisees? They don't deny that the murders took place. Right. They don't say that they didn't happen. And since there is no more, uh, there, there's no other victim to blame in the moment, they crucify their ancestors. Right. And they say, had we been there, we would not have done what they did. And Jesus, you know, Yahshua responds to them, uh, you have done it before. You will do it again. Go ahead and get it over with. Kill me. You will kill me. So go ahead and get it over with. Because you always, this is an axiomatic, inevitable byproduct of human 
culture. Well, and also, and, can, just real quick, he's also making a point, right? Gerard makes this point there um, that it's in fact part of the cover up, right? That yes. that the cover the by with the Pharisees saying, well, if we wouldn't, we would not have done this, right? We, right. we wouldn't have done this. So you, you, so now the, it's, it's kind of like a little shift there, but who's the victim now? Oh, the victim are your ancestors who killed the prophets. Now you're, do, yes. you're, you're yes. victimizing them. But yes. the problem with that is that in doing that, you're not actually taking responsibility that if you were there, you we would, would have, have done, done it. And, and he makes this point, I think, with Peter, where he says, in, 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 I saw Satan fall like lightning, that the psychological interpretation of Peter saying, oh, well, you know, this went up to Peter actually misses the fact that if we were in Peter's shoes, we would have been affected by the contagion too. Yes. And, and, and may, I'm going to jump ahead, but we can go back. But I mean, this is something we, we've talked about briefly before, but uh, I mean, before the podcast, that is, and that is, this is actually one of the, this is why um, authentic worship is in fact, has to be anamnetic, that it has to have this amnes anamnesis quality, which says, so like in the Seder meal, you, the, the, the Jewish uh, participant says, this is what God did for me when he got me out of Egypt, not my ancestors, because you're there. And then in, 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 in uh, you know, in, in, in Christian kind of div divine liturgy, at least in the Orthodox and Catholic tradition, uh, which I know better, and you could explain it in, in maybe some of the evangelical traditions, there is this sense that like, it's a representation of the sacrifice. And so that's why the confession of through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, that we crucified Christ and we are saved by Christ, not the Jews crucified Christ or somebody in the past crucified Christ. Okay, and this so is a real danger because it, if you lose that anamnetic element, you open up the door to scapegoating, which of course we've seen over and over again in, in Christian history. So, this is, you've pointed out precisely how, and we have to do this or else we would be missing the whole lesson Gerard is trying to teach us. In Christian history, the move is to say, we did not crucify Christ, the Jews did. Right, which is a big and problem. We can, have, we can have a debate as to whether or not that is actually the intent of the authors of the Gospels, and that may be controversial to say, but what is not controversial is to say that from the time that those texts appeared to, uh, to the present day, there has this uh, very, very shameful tradition of anti-Semitism sure. that is based in the text that the Jews killed Christ. Mm -hmm. And and to have a, a text like in the Gospel of John, maybe I'm getting myself into trouble here. We can argue about it, but to have the not the Jewish leaders, it says the people in the Gospel of John, that over and against this sort of these fantastic protestations of Pilate. Three times Pilate tries to get Jesus off the hook, and they say the Jews say the crowds say. We have no king but Caesar. And then to say, may his blood be upon our heads and the heads of our children. When we read those texts, we say, ah, see, there, there, there it is. They killed Christ mm -hmm. as opposed to the Romans killed Christ. Or opposed to what I think Gerard would say. And what I think, you know, clearly... I mean, as you know, I'm not denying any of the anti-Semitism that, that has cropped up over and again, and it is shameful. But clearly there is a essential part of the tradition that it wasn't really the Romans or the Jews who, cry, who killed Christ. It was we who killed Christ. I mean, this is the fundamental point is that, and this Gerard tries to bring out, right? This is a point in Gerard, but let me keep not interrupt you because I think that that's, this is a, it's a big problem because you if it's the Jews who killed Christ or the Romans who killed Christ, well, in the ones I'm innocent, you know, I'm a good Christian. I wouldn't do anything wrong. No, that, 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 that is, that is the, that is the point is that we do not realize now we, you're saying correctly that the liturgy contains these confessions that it is we that killed Christ. But what Gerard would say is that the mythology still is intact 
because in other ways, in the rest of our lives, maybe with relation to the gospel story, we might be able Mm -hmm. to admit, oh, we put Christ upon the cross. But meanwhile, as soon as you leave, your little bottom leaves that pew and yep. walks down that aisle and you <laughs> go out into, in the world, you are on Twitter vilifying and uh, in your heart wishing that people were dead. Who are your enemies? Uh, you are participating in this victimization, uh, this scapegoating mechanism that's a part of mimetic desire. And you think you're right. Mm-hmm. We think we're right. right. And the cycle keeps perpetuating. So I think there's two, two things of Gerard that I think are important. One is related to the previous, and then one's related to your point about desire. So let me just say the first one. I, I found it. I was looking for it in that, in that essay uh, called The Evangelical Subversion of Myth. Um, but actually, he make, this point is made where um, there's this question like, do the Pharisees deserve this um, this um critique that Jesus had given to him that you mentioned, right? Woe to you. Um, and he says that perpetually denying and practice by restricting to Judaism, the consequences of the Christian revelation, they wanted to divert from themselves, right? So by perpetually saying, oh, it's the Jews who did this. You want to divert from themselves. He said, if Pharisaism were not the highest mode of religious life yet attained by man, it could not stand for every other form. The words uttered by the gospel would not reach all cultural forms at the same time. So the role of Judaism, as you mentioned earlier, Greg, right, is a light to the nations, right? As representative of humanity as a whole is one with the idea frequently repeated in the New Testament itself that the election of Israel never has and never will be canceled, that they play a privileged role in the revelation of the entire truth. And uh, and so the point is the critique, uh, this is Gerard's point, right? The critique of Christ, of Pharisaism, is not kind of the liberal rabbi who says, oh, they're just too focused on the rules, or nor is it an anti-Semitic because he's obviously Jew, and so are all the, you know, the writers of the of the gospels were Jewish. So uh you you have uh you have this, it, it's rather saying, look, the highest representative of humanity is guilty of it. Everybody's guilty of it. You're all guilty of it. And so this is the kind of danger. And I think this goes back to your point is that um, if we don't internalize, as it were, the liturgy to affect all parts of our life, what we do is we're, we, we end up going back into this mimetic cycle of blaming others, looking for a victim, looking for a scapegoat. And so the, la- the point I was going to make to that is That's actually, I think, helps shed light, at least to me, on this point where Gerard talks about, that's why Jesus says, imitate him, Uh, as opposed to imitating the gurus around, right? That your mimetic desire should be an imitation of Jesus who doesn't have the desire. There's not the egotistical battle, right? Between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And And that to be holy as your and perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, I think is the, is the question. And then this gets to the question, which we, I don't know if we'll have time to discuss, but of the positive elements of mimetic desire, because Gerard says mimetic desire is not bad. It's actually intrinsically good, but it's, it's how it's part of our human it's nature. It becomes a part of mythology that makes it bad. Right. So Greg, there's so many things we're going to talk about. Why don't we stop now? And okay. uh, we will schedule another time and we'll make part two. So this will be part one of the podcast. Is there anything you want to end, like a, a kind of a closing idea uh, at this kind of first introductory into Gerard? We'll talk a little bit more about mythology, the cycle of violence, uh, the tension between myth and truth. But is there anything you want to kind of conclude with here at this last part of the podcast, or, or the first part, I should say, um, that is really essential to understand Gerard? I would say it really is not... The scapegoating mechanism is, I think, a little more obvious. I think what's less obvious is the way in which our mind immediately goes to letting ourselves off of the hook and exempting ourselves from this uh, archaic form of mythology that pervades all cultures. So it's that Mm -hmm. internal recognition that this is always about somebody else and not about me. You know, it's uh, real quick before I let you go. I think it's, it's an interesting thing. This is where theory really comes deep into practice. And it's where, you know, C.S. Lewis has this uh, thing about, you know, 
about we always think it's somebody else's problem but actually that's we're right, really the problem right. and so right. so we'll end there with uh, with uh, little did we know that all this uh, theory has deep implication in our own lives but we'll continue uh, in part two uh, later Dr. Gregory Thornberry thank you very much for your time today thank you 